On the way back, of course, you pick up huge amounts of things at the airport. Vital Hydra solutions. I've never seen... The journalist Elise, who is the author of Flawless, uh, excellent piece about uh, what she calls uh, the rise of K-beauty, the K-beauty capital. I've never seen anything quite like it. Um, you know, I travel extensively, but this, this obsession with skincare and skincare products, what are they aiming for? They are aiming for a certain standardized perfection that comes out of K-pop and K-drama that you've probably already seen. The growth of K-beauty is really tied, Richard, to the growth of Korean visual exports all over the world. So you have seen the look of K-pop idols. And now the industry and the medical aesthetic advances are all organized around helping all of us try and aspire to those ideals. But Richard, I have to ask you, what was it like for you? How was your spa experience? Oh, you know, there was nothing gentle about it. But oh. you know, the, the, no, no, brilliant. Nothing. It was. It was none of that sort of uh, tinkly music. In you know uh, uh, that you often get in Southeast Asia. No, this was get your elbows in, get your elbows in, get your exfoliating done, and get on with it. Um, and unfortunately, uh, if, if we weren't quite as um, as squeamish, you'd have seen uh, a little bit more of my backside than you'd want to. Uh, look, I'm re <laughs> reading your. Well, it's all al fresco there, isn't it? Look, I, unfortunately, I'd made notes in the book, which somebody's given me a different copy but the, the the one of the things you talk about is this it's not aiming for some sort of whiter than white mythical western look we often think that's what the goal is that they're going for whether and not just with skin bleaching or whatever but you're saying that yeah. that's not what k k beauty is about that's right the desire and the standards are quite local um there was this move, I think, in the late 90s when a lot right. of plastic surgery came out of South Korea in which a lot of um, Western journalists were saying, oh, the Asian viewers or Asian audience just wants to appear white. But really what I found in my research is that, you know, half of all Asians actually do have double eyelids naturally. And so the aspiration is really quite local. It is you want to look like the stars or the celebrities in your own region or in China. It's the Chinese celebrities. In Korea, it's the Korean celebrities. And so it was a real misunderstanding or misinterpretation right. back in the 90s. Is it healthy in a sense that and we're going to be talking a bit major about online um, mental health, but is it healthy for a, a generation to become so obsessed by a look? Questioning, of course, indeed, whether half these things actually work or not. <laughs> I do think it's morally problematic because just right. as we shouldn't try and fight racism by making everyone white and we shouldn't try and fight homophobia by making everyone straight, we shouldn't fight lookism, which is appearance-based discrimination, by making everyone pretty according to the standards of the day. Mm. And so what I argue is that we need to actually rethink the way that we overlink appearance and worthiness and think about beauty in far more nuanced ways. Oh, but that's, that is so difficult to do. Absolutely. It absolutely is. It's a huge challenge, but I think we have, uh, have an opportunity. And also the cynical look is what other choice do we have? Right. I mean, do we continue down this road in which these technological filters and digital mm -hmm. media continue to feed us these standards that are more alarming and cyborgian and really feel out of reach? I actually went into one of those hellfire saunas downstairs as well where they sort of turn up the literally the flow it was it was an extraordinary experience um i wish we could enjoy more with a with a solution on our faces and next time we talk we will be suitably dolled up for that thank you very much i appreciate